I've had the privilege of knowing Sakai for many years and have a large admiration for her practice. Um, and I've always worked has blown me away since we met, what was it like, 10 days ago? Yeah. A week ago, something like that. And in the conversations we've had, it's become really clear how important it is to have this collaboration happen, but also for the work to be shown in Scotland because it's coming alongside many important conversations on race, presence, authenticity, um, and also multiple histories and diaspora conversations. So because of the emotional nature of this work, which when I looked at the portfolio, to be honest with you, part of me really was so moved, I, I felt like weeping at times. And I think it's important that we consider this a gift thing. It's not often when we have this privilege of bringing together such important makers and thinkers who are really looking at how we understand identity, authenticity, what it means to inhabit these different, these different zones. So I'd like to pass you over to Sakai, who's going to begin. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, I'm just going to try and very quickly go through my practice, because I am a little bit of a nervous author. Um, on the uh, sort of topic of the day of Black Femininity of the African Spirit, I think that my work kind of, in some ways, deals with those issues, um, but I feel almost like in a certain way that's been a sort of positioning that that's the uh, kind of almost placed upon myself because of my identity. Um, I think my work strives to sort of um, allow for the black figure to um, embody um, and to convey universal human experiences. But obviously with um, my racialization and my, um, and my gendering, I think that it's, it becomes almost a very, very sort of narrow in its uh, scope because of the way that people are, are uh, receive it. So I'm going to go through from very early to now, sort of uh, looking at what I was working on when I was uh, studying at Duncan Johnston Art School. Um, this series was called Visions of Half Sleep, and it was based on the fact that I am someone who um, suffers from insomnia and um, sleep paralysis, and I was kind of working through these um, these issues in my work. And at the time, I used uh, the white figure in my work because it was easier to find models living in Scotland at the time. I was studying an art school where I was pretty much the only black person present. So um, I was sort of trying to convey the feelings that rather than a specific imagery that was coming from dream. Um, I was looking at the hypnagogic state between sleeping and waking and the sort of visions that you have in that space, which I would say were, um, could be considered half sleep. Um, the next image is from a series that was um, almost adjacent to that, which was called In the Moment of Waking. Um, and it, again, using a white figure to represent these ideas. And I found that when uh, the work was seen, uh, or whenever I uh, showed this work during my degree show, um, people really understood what the process of the work, or what the subject matter of the work was. Um, and they really like, felt that they could relate to this, um, this kind of strange in-between sleep um, state. However, when I used the black figure, there was a kind of slight change to the way that people saw the work. The next images are from Eigengrau, which is um, which means intrinsic light. It's a German word for, for the kind of way that you the, the grey um, light that you see when you kind of close your eyes in darkness. You don't have like the blackness behind your eyes when you close your eyes in the dark. It's this kind of strange grey. So I was trying to capture that, and these. Three series were kept, were shown during my degree show alongside each other, and were very much tied to the same concepts. But as soon as I used the black figure, it's when people started to see, 
Oh, I see. Your work is about race. So I started to sort of try and interrogate that. Like, what? why was it suddenly about race when before people could understand that it was about um, the heavenly state and sleep and all of these uh, topics that I was actually uh, working through at the time. So I was sort of forced to start thinking about my tradition as an artist in the wider context of the art world as a black woman and what my identity sort of um, does to my work, especially when I use the black figure. This series, Mashabi, was made during my master's degree show in collaboration with a photographer, Brindis Blackadder. And the work was sort of looking at um, my undergraduate um, dissertation, which was kind of trying to visually interpret what I was kind of thinking through at the time. And my dissertation was titled Blackness in Contemporary Art. And it was looking at whether blackness was a hindering factor to success in the art world. So the, the books that you can see on the table are sort of these, uh, I would say, seminal texts in relation to um, African, contemporary African art that I was looking at while I was trying to figure out, like, okay, so how do you, how do you make work as an artist of colour in a way that allows for you to have the freedom to talk about anything that um, you'd like to talk about? Um, I was looking at other artists to see if anybody else was able to sort of navigate that space of identity. And Mashavi is a Shona word and a concept related to spirit, which is about these, um, these spirits of people who died when they were either away from home or if who were not given the sort of correct or proper funerary rites. So they um, kind of become these um, sort of malevolent characters that come into the lives of ordinary people, sometimes in their dreams. And they, um, they're they not negative or positive, they're sort of just almost playful, like tricksters. So I placed myself in my kind of studious uh, um, position here on, at the table, trying to figure out, okay, so what does it mean to be an artist of colour? What does it mean to be a black woman artist? And then the shabby, which is a singular word um, or term, uh, is sort of taunting me in the background. So. During the time that I was working on Mishabi, I was actually, I spent about a year uh, grading across a room in my apartment in my flat in Dundee. And it was just, it was the process that I was using to sort of think through what I was uh, working on. And I actually showed it as a sort of um, a durational documented performance. It was using a GoPro, a, a, videos of myself um, braiding a, a synthetic hair from one end, end of the room to another. And during my degree show, it was in a 10 meter long room. And you'll see the next image is basically uh, an image of it stretched all the way across the room. Um, and sort of created a sort of dividing line between two images from the Mishabi series on either side. This, um, was then developed further for the Glasgow International Festival this year uh, for Breeding Across the Pool, where I sort of took that same performance and brought it out into the space of Govan Hill Bass, which was actually in the main pool area that they, were, they used for exhibitions and events. So I braided again across a space, and this time it was a 22 metre long pool. And I did it as a live performance. It was my first ever live performance. So that was quite exciting and stressful. And I couldn't have done this um, on my own. This was a, a collaborative process as well because I needed someone to be able to sort of take the hair and hand it to me and uh, to sort of like give me some coconut oil so I could like kind of tie it. So you can see in this image here, um, my friend from um, Yonapro, Fasola, passing me hair. Um, and another Yonapu member, Ima, holding it up because it just got heavier and heavier as we added more hair to it. And our exhibition was basically looking at sort of how we can, um, 
how we inhabit spaces and reflecting on our sort of our individual senses of self. There was myself and uh, three other artists who are also black women living in Scotland. And you can see these images are just me sort of tying the um, the braid up and kind of uh, securing it at the top of the pool. And uh, this is an image of it in like now completed um, with the work from my Solo series um, displays underneath. Masoro is basically a series of work that was kind of me trying to tackle um, or deal with grief. And um, so I see this motif of this red braid kind of coming into my work over and over again and the colours, red, black and white kind of, um, kind of coming into it um, in lots of different projects that I've been working on recently. I'm thinking about the significance and symbolism of certain colours. And in Shona culture, red uh, is a colour that's used um, in sort of some funerary rites. So it's kind of um, tied to the process of grief as well. So yeah, <laughs> what we're here to talk about basically is the Body of Land project, which I'm um, so excited to be uh, given the opportunity to work with another artist, Alora Nyango, and um, really kind of spent most of the year doing a lot of different kinds of research and also got the opportunity to go to Nairobi for a month to do a residency there. And while I was there, I was doing a lot of drawing. And I was sort of thinking about the drawing in the same way that I was doing the braiding across the room over the course of the year. I was just thinking about, you know, what kinds of, um, like kind of almost responding to the title body of land. I was thinking about land, I was thinking about the body, I was thinking about all of these repeating patterns that happen, that, that you see throughout nature. And when I was, when I arrived in uh, Nairobi, one of the things that I was most enamored by was the red, red soil, which reminds me so much of home because uh, we also have that red earth in, in Zimbabwe as well. So I was sort of taking a lot of pictures of the ground and, um, and then doing these drawings and thinking through um, why I had this visceral reaction to it. Um, this image here is basically sort of reflecting on the um, these sort of processes that I use within the work that um, is kind of why I would call myself multidisciplinary as an artist because the photography work is there and it's not the, it's not the end point of, of the project but it's almost um, brings everything together that I've been thinking through but a lot of the work that I do is actually quite hands-on and tactile and, and working with material and objects similar to the way that Mishabe related to another project that I did called Jin, where I was thinking about sound, trying to depict sound and how to think about um, what hair is doing in relation to like all of these other um, ways of making. So and at the end of mine, because I actually didn't have any more slides, but I obviously would like to kind of uh, go back to some of these things, um, conversations about process, I think, when okay. we really discuss. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming to this. Um, I wanted to start my gifting with something that I wrote, just to warm myself up. Um, <laughs> it's called, I wrote something. <laughs> I wrote something. I wrote it in English to make it more accessible to everyone in the room, hopefully. Sometimes I write in drawings. Sometimes I write in soundless video art. Sometimes I write in film. Sometimes I write in photographs named after the English names my friends and I were assigned at birth, but discarded. Sometimes I write in dance and movement but that's personal for me and the walls of my house to see. Or public for nights when the moon and the music and the drinks are too good to ignore. And Sakai casually mentions that another now mutual friend of ours is the best dancer she's ever seen. So now I have to show her she's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 
And sometimes I write about things, black women that I'm searching for, faces that often go unnamed at the verge of being erased, projects that become too sacred to share, invocations too intimate to replay. But today I wrote something in English so we can all relate to it. It's a simple sentence and it says, the searching is supreme. The art object is just the evidence of the searching. And so now I'll present evidence of the various searchings I've been doing recently. So when I write in video art, this is a project of mine that was called Maqueda that I did in 2016 in Nairobi. It's a digital installation that was looking at, I think, my personal paranoia when it comes to the internet um, and who has access to what data, why, when. Um, and for it, I mind, I hacked myself, which is always a fun thing to do if you're already paranoid about <laughs> being hacked. Um, and I created a guardian of the internet who would protect me, but she also um, came from the legend of Makeda, who was the queen of Sheba, goes by different names in different places and stuff. And her space was kind of to reflect back in an attempt to start conversations, you know, around social media and the kind of space for dark-skinned black women in social media and the kind of violences that are there and the kind of joys that we find, you know, being able to reach to each other in those spaces. Um, so that was Makeda. Um, this is Lambe, which uh, was named at uh, um, Young Contradamax did a poem called Lambe, which starts, Give me back my black dolls. And I'd realized at this point that every time I went somewhere on the continent, I kind of went out of the way to collect um, dolls, the, the dolls that are made out of cloth. And I was collecting them because I just, I thought like, it was quite interesting to see what, how women were seen as dolls in those different places. So in Rwanda, the doll would be shaped in a completely different way than in Kenya. And um, at this time, I was searching for the presence of Black and African women in Western archives, so in films, um, in photographs and paintings. And I came across the work of um, William Kittner, who was an American chemical engineer, actually, who after retiring decided um, what he was going to do with his life is go around different continents and take footage of the natives in their natural habitat. And in his journeys, he'd come to Kenya um, in the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. So he'd been there thrice. Um, and part of this was my coming to terms with the kind of discomfort it felt to see um, people that I would think of as like, oh, this could be a friend's grandmother now, or this could be, you know, a neighbor, like an elderly neighbor or something. But at the same time, to kind of see the, the defiance um, and the spirit that, that they showed in these films. And so I took the dolls that I was collecting and kind of mimicked the gestures of the women in the film. So that was Lambe. Um, Ritual Realities was a digital media residency that was motion triggered. And that was in, in Kampala in 2016. I was running around quite a bit in 2016. 
Um, and it was, again, about searching for these women that we see in photographs and, and films and, and archives, and we don't know their names and we don't know their stories. So their faces is kind of all that we have. Um, but bringing them into spaces of, of ritual. So this was in Uganda, and there was a lot of dancing and um, kind of gesturing towards those women, you know, as a form of honor to them. Um, the Library of Silence, again, my work is, is very, my searching is mostly for black women. Um, so the Library of Silence was a motion-triggered video in installation that I did in Accra, um, again in 2016. And it was um, because I'd been collecting these black women, uh, I had a lot of footage that had no context whatsoever. But it was just like, okay, so I was watching this film, and for two seconds, there was a black woman here. And I was looking at this archive, and at the back of that shop, there was a black woman. And um, it occurred to me that I was trying to create a kind of archive of the unnamed. And so I presented that archive as the Library of Silence, because there was no way of finding these women or telling their stories. So you just kind of had these faces and these motions um, and that's what I presented in APA. And photography-wise, um, I'll talk about Visibility is a Trap, which is how Arpita and I met. Uh, <laughs> she came for the opening of the show, which was called To Revolutionary Type Love at the Gotti Institute. Uh, it opened um, on Ida Hobbit because there's been queer is not exactly illegal in Kenya. Um, being caught in the act of um, basically sleeping with someone of the same sex is what's illegal. And so there's like a weird in-between space where um, we had the freedom to have a pride right just as long as, I don't know, it's a weird law. It's like we're free, but we're not free. So um, visibility is a trap for me was a way of trying to express this, trying to express that. It's like you can be queer, but if you're too queer, then you know, you're entrapped by the government. But if you're just queer enough that it's OK, then you're fine. Um, so this was just looking at kind of celebrating this in-between space where you can recreate yourself however you want to recreate yourself. Um, but also that if you do it too much, then yeah. And so I was looking at two people. One, this is Nadia. She was born in Dundee and she's a friend of ours. And I was kind of looking at ideas of obviously like how to present bodies that are considered female in a way that is not considered female. Um, how to present, how basically to present like a gender queerness that's not not like readily tangible that you can't like see immediately. Um, and also um, the the idea of like strength and the idea of visibility and the idea of. I guess like black female strength and, and what that is or how that is um, taken. And on the other hand, I think Jamie's also in here. So these are my friends, Jamie and Nadia, who worked with me as I tried to explore this kind of space of recreation. There are some nods that I make in the work um, because Jamie's a drag queen, which is an interesting concept for me in the space of Nairobi, just because Nairobi is not really, Nairobi's version of drag is like RuPaul, which I guess is the most common version of drag now. But you know, I find that there's like a deeper American history to it. 
so there are nods that, that I was making to like everyone's identity and how they identify and how that would be photographed um, or presented. But this was, this was the searching for that space, you know, that line that you can't really cross because visibility is a trap. Yeah, um, so for this project, I am working on, the easiest way to start is to say that I, I come from an ethnicity known as the Luo, and the Luo philosophy of the soul dictates that when you die, your soul splits into three. And when it splits into three, one part of the soul um, looks at all the good that was done to it in its life, and then it pays back this good. And then the other part of the soul looks at all the bad that was done to its life, and it pays back the bad. And something that maybe I haven't mentioned before is that like, once it pays back the good, it goes away, and once it pays back the bad, it goes away. And then there's the third part, which I'm now linking kind of to the Mashavi, which looks at the funerary rites, which looks at why it died. And so it, it looks at um, if the body is being honored in the proper way during funerary rites. And it looks at if, you know, all the cousins and all the relatives are mourning in, in proper ways. And from that, it either makes the decision to stay as a good ancestor and to take care of all the people because, you know, grief is a, is a rough thing to have to go through. Um, but if it was dishonored during the funerary rites, then it stays as, you know, I wouldn't say a bad ancestor because you don't really have the concept of like good and bad. It just stays to kind of make people miserable. I mean, the whole idea is that you have to go through the grieving process because it's not good to keep things inside, right? So if you didn't grieve properly, so if I didn't grieve, um, my uncle died last day in January. And if I followed this principle, if I didn't grieve properly when he died, his soul would keep coming, not really coming to me, but would keep um, bringing up things in my life that would bring up the sadness, because the sadness had to, has to like leave me for it to be fine. Um, so I was, that's kind of what I'm looking at, but I'm looking at it in, in a grander context with like black women in Glasgow, and I'm trying to create with them these three parts of their soul, like what they would picture these three parts of their soul to be and in a photography series. So that's what my project is about. Um, thank you so much, both of you. There's so much we could take in from what's been said. And like I said before, this is really quite an emotional moment, I think, for many of us here to hear both of you here sharing and, and gifting us with knowledge of your practice and insights into it. And something which keeps coming to me is how we understand the weight of history as women of color with different subjectivities, different um, pressures and privileges of not being able to challenge how our images are created or perpetuated and the influence they still have today. And it seems as though both of you in quite different ways are really tackling tackling history head on. And a question which I had, I think, because in your, in one of the, the last bodies of work you showed, Awar, where you were working collaboratively, I'm really interested in hearing a bit more about how you, you take on this, this research and how collaboration becomes almost a way of, of thinking through these ideas mm -hmm. as much in relationship to history as in the contemporary? Yeah. I think for me, because the, the space of the artist in dual culture um, was always collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, it was always like a call and response mm -hmm. thing. And I also feel like 
as a practice, it makes it much easier for everyone to feel safe and for everyone to feel like properly represented, especially where black women um, are involved. Because as you said, it, it's kind of just been a history of um, not being included in your own narrative, you know, and, or not being heard or not being named. And so for me, it's just a way of countering that, you know, it's to come in and say, okay, I'm here, but I'm, I'm not here as the person who is in charge of what is to be said. I'm just here as the person who, ha who ha perhaps has the tools to say what it is, you know, and if we can say it together, then that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I feel as though, in so many ways, that question really relates to your practice as well, Sakai. Um, knowing your work as I do, if I think about the work you did at GI, but also the role of the ritual and the almost the, the kind of fastidiousness in the making and the braiding of the hair and making these drawings, it feels as though these are often quite collaborative actions. When I look at the images from GI, um, and seeing there with Usola and different Yonafra members, there seems to so there's this collective discussion, which is very diasporic. You know, Glasgow is really blessed in the fact that there is a collective diasporic cohort of women, especially working together and thinking through these ideas. And I wondered what resonance that has with how you think through your practice, you know, as an individual. Um, I think it's maybe something that's changing um, my practice, like um, because I feel almost like for most of my life quite isolated from um, the black community because I don't I don't think there was ever a singular black community in Glasgow, um, and ever since joining Yonafo, I've found that I have just suddenly found out that there were lots of people that I could have known all of this time, and we've all just sort of almost just found each other all at once, which is really amazing. And, and then the sort of way that I've started to look at my work since then has sort of, um, I've realised that there's no space for me to, to move in from a sort of personal and quite um, self-reflective standpoint to looking at the collective and thinking about us as sort of like, obviously we're not, um, monolithic but we have so many um, shared experiences mm. of living here and, um, and, and and feeling that sort of hyper visibility and then um, yeah just sort of wondering about like how I can sort of start working more collaboratively with other women and um, with other black people in general like within my practice so I think it's almost evolving in, in time. I think, um, you know, going on what you said, obviously these, these collective bodies of knowledge, um, which on offer has become, a, I think, a really big part of Glasgow's art community as well as out with that, um, is really key, but also I think, you know, you've been building this practice, building your research for such a long time. I think back to a degree show and Brady across the room, I'm really interested in the tensions of that as a solo, solo piece of work and also with what that means when you do these works collectively because both of you seem to have this very collaborative aspect to making images which I think really speaks of the hierarchy of the histories of making an image of a black woman or a woman of colour and how it feels as though there's a real with rather than an of that's going on. Um, but also I'd really love to hear you both speak about the different processes that go on to making your work because it feels very symbiotic, all of the different behind the scenes actions which each of you do. Alwa, oh, would you mind? Sure. Yeah, um, I think Sakai and I were saying the other day that sometimes it feels like everything that happens before you click, you know, and you have the shot feels almost more important than the photograph itself. Um, there's, there's a huge space in like making and there's a huge space in the conversations you have with the model before the image is made. And there's a huge space in like the stories 
um, that are being shared. You know, and that's why I said that you know the searching is supreme. The the, the art objects are just the evidence of it. You know, um, and I was talking to um, some of the, the models that I've had volunteer about recording the conversations we have because it's not just me saying this is my concept and this is um, what I want to do. I'm also like. Um, opening it up to them to say this is what I want to express, right? And as much as I can do that in, in photography, I'm, I'm a very huge believer in like allowing all the languages that can be spoken to be spoken. And you know, so I want to be able to be like, okay, my language for this project is photography, but if you want to add your voice to it, you know, then I'm very open to having like audio to go with with the portraits, because it's not me coming here, you know, as because I am a guest, I'm here for two more weeks. And um, if anyone allows me into their life and into their story, that's, that's a gift that I will not take for granted, you know. So it's not just about me coming here and saying, this is what I want to do and do this for me, please. You know, it's, it's a conversation that we're having. And that's what makes it, art for me. Yeah, I think it's um, maybe because I've spent so much time photographing myself, I'm in a sort of transition here of like realising how important it is to have those conversations, those really deep conversations, because I always know what I'm trying to convey. Yeah. And I think that when you have a model in space and you're kind of almost like, I don't know, I had this idea that maybe they would just know. No. Yeah. <laughs> But that's not feasible. So I think that um, what you're planning to do like, makes sense. It's a collaboration between yourself and your models as well. And I'm thinking, I don't know, I'm not really sure exactly how I'm going to move into like, uh, creating that sort of that dialogue because I feel like quite a lot of the imagery is kind of in here. Yeah. And I'm kind of wondering about like what. Um, what someone else can sort of bring into it if I sort of actually divulge what is in here. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, I, I just find it quite hard to articulate what, what I'm seeing when I close my eyes. But it's just um, almost like a very precise image that I'm sort of chasing. Mm -hmm. And so um, maybe I need to sort of allow um, for that kind of reciprocity within the process. So, yeah. So it, I think that's another thing about the, the collaboration. It's like, Watching you work and listening to you kind of like way the moves of uh, working in your process has kind of helped me think through mine a lot more as well. Especially since I'm now moving into this like, you know, working with other people rather than just mm -hmm. with myself. Yeah. Um, both of you have spoken quite a bit about sleep and the lack of sleep. Yeah. And as someone who also struggles <laughs> with sleep. I found myself really thinking about those moments of being half awake and half asleep and almost haunted by images, you know, and I think at times you both said before the talk about that being a real space for, for process, yeah. but also for understanding these histories and understanding these memories, but also how sleep or the lack thereof can almost become a zone where you channel something different. You know, and it, and it can be this, this interesting midpoint between awake and sleep, sleepiness where, where you're more open to being haunted by memories, ancestral or from this lifetime. Yeah. And I wondered if, because sometimes I think when we, we look at, um, at different forms of knowledges, there's always a privilege towards the idea of authenticity. Mm -hmm. The idea that um, living out with the the place of your presumed origin, you have a lack of access to that ancestral knowledge, which I think is a really important thing to bring up today, especially while we're, we're discussing, we're having a diasporic conversation. So it'd be great to hear you speak more about, about that idea of memory and its relationship to sleep and how you process these ideas. I think for me, like, how sleep works just on a basic level um, or almost falling asleep. My, 
my mom um, makes a joke that because I was born at around 2 a.m., I kind of, I either sleep at 2 a.m. or if I sleep before, wake up at 2 a.m. And she's like, ah, you're coming back to the world. <laughs> like, you're remembering how you came to the world. And for me, it's, it's, it's just a matter of when in the waking state, there are so many barriers um, that you have up or that I personally have up. You know, there's so many things that I'm like, I feel unable to feel or unable to process. I'm just like trying to get through the day and to get through the day, you know, safely and warm and like having eaten and having gone through like the meetings that I have to go through or having performed all the different performances that I'm supposed to perform. Um, in that day, where they be like performing femininity or like Africanness or whatever it is. Um, and it feels like at that moment when I'm about to sleep is when I feel the most safe to remember, you know, um, is when I feel the most open to all the ideas that I wouldn't have been open to like during the day because, you know, I was busy thinking, um, is this the right word to say at this moment, you know, or uh, how do I make this person feel better about this thing that I said three days ago, you know. Um, so for me, that kind of state before sleep usually is when all the darlings are dead, so I'm not even precious about if this idea is going to be the next biggest thing that I will do, will I do a bigger thing, is this thing big enough? Um, so all those pressures are gone and I can just like be in that space and look at things that, that I've seen during the day that I didn't have the time to process, you know, so I, I, I would often, um, I don't watch films a lot because I come out of it with a headache. Mm -hmm. And then because I know like before I go to sleep, I'm going to be thinking, okay, but when that character said this, <laughs> ah, and I, because I'm a, I write sci-fi and I'm a huge sci-fi fan, you know, and sometimes I would wake up at 4 a.m. to look at like the new like YouTube video about like the Marvel theory of whether like Loki is alive or not, you know, so there's things um, that like really, really haunt me. So I try to not deal with um but i feel like that's that's usually the space where that comes you know and it could be outside things or it could also just be you know the feelings that i didn't want to feel during the day you know the discomforts that i was like i do not have time for this like um so it, it's it's always like an interesting space for memory and it's also my family has this um, interesting ability that was completely normal to me because of how frequently it happened, where like my mom would be like, oh, I dreamt of your grandmother and she said to do this. And I'd be like, okay. And then I'd have to do that, you know. And sometimes like my grandmother would appear to me in my dreams and we didn't speak the same language when she was alive. So it's always, I always kind of have to like text my mom and be like, okay, so grandma appeared and she did this, what does it mean? And then she'll like translate it for me. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Um, so that's kind of just been like something that my family does. And then I'd speak to other people about it and then they'd be like, that's not, that's not like, what happens in other people's families? <laughs> um, <laughs> So it's, it's almost like an, a, a sacred space, you know, but then again, like that's, that's the newer philosophy that if I'm not, if my grandmother is not done with me, even if she dies, she's not done with me, right? So when we're done with each other is when she'll go. But, you know, for now, she, she's not afraid to like knock me over the head and be like, why are you in law school? You know, so, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, I think I'll ask what you said about it's a safer space, it's like, the, like kind of 
feeling that I have as well. Um, it, when you were saying about like your grandmother coming and visiting you in your dreams, um, and then I have had entities of some with formless or of entities come to me with messages in my dreams as well from um, from someone, some potentially an ancestor, and wake up with a full un, full image of what they looked like and with the words that they said to me, and I can just write it down, and then it's almost like knowledge coming from somewhere, which is really interesting. And I would, in, t in terms of memory, I'm always wondering about if these are my memories, mm -hmm. or if this is something that's coming from like a sort of um, inherited or sort of uh, transmuted memory from, from my ancestors. So I'm really interested in that. <laughs> wow, that's really incredible hearing that. I feel almost so I'm now looking at my insomnia with a completely different lens and wondering if I'm being visited or I'm trying to receive some form of trans transmission. Well, that wasn't a joke, but it's a transmission from somewhere. Um, but it sounds as though it's such an important sacred space for learning and unlearning and thinking, and I feel like maybe this is the space where the ancestors who've had those images stolen from them, they visit you, really kind of give you the impetus to make the important work, which you're both doing. It is a process of unlearning to be able to see work where women of colour are regal and challenging with many subjectivities. Okay. Um, well, we're going to hang about for a bit, so if anyone does want to speak to Awa Sakai, we'll be here. Let's give them a big round of applause.